Um, so I'm not going to uh, waste your time. We, we all know why we're here. Uh, uh, from the community of iron trappers, most of us. Um, now, these three days are going to be uh, obviously tailored toward quantum applications, and many of those have to do with quantum information science. But not all. There's, there's, there's uh, 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 some very interesting work, especially in the topic of molecular ions, and uh, a new community that's kind of uh, rising up. Uh, precision measurements, quantum limited vitrology, quantum simulation, decoherence. So it's much broader than just QIS. So that's all I have to say. So I'm going to, let's see, I guess I'll, I'll share the first session. And for those of you that are speaking, I'm told you have to use the microphone because it's being recorded, uh, I guess, for webcasting. Uh, so uh, although the acoustics are pretty good here, please wear the microphone. So with that, uh, we'll get started with our opening speaker, Jake Taylor from uh, JQI and NIST. His office down the hall from mine. <laughs> and uh, still don't understand it. His title is Beyond Linear Traps for Scaling Ion Trap Systems. But anyway, I'm sure. <laughs> so, first of all, I want to thank the organizers for putting this group of great people together uh, and even inviting someone like me who kind of dabbles in the territory of ion traps among several different things. It's also a lot of fun to be back at ITAMP. This is where I started scientifically many years ago. And uh, it's good to see some familiar faces from that era as well. The work I'm going to talk about today is done in collaboration with many people. And it's done at the Joint Quantum Institute, which is a collaboration between the National Institute of Standards and Technology uh, in Gaithersburg and the University of Maryland <coughs> in College Park. And I know that we're talking very broadly about quantum applications while we're here this, these few days. I wanted to sort of provide my take on why I'm focused on ion trap systems and their, what their interests are to me. And a lot of this has to do with the great promises of quantum information science. And these are implicit in every discussion we have about why we look at the intersection of quantum devices and information science. And they have to do with three basic concepts. One is that of quantum communication in which you're using the fundamental laws as we understand them of quantum mechanics to ensure security and also to produce entanglement at longer and longer distances and larger and larger length scales. Another promise is that of quantum simulation in which we hope to understand complicated systems at the quantum mechanical level by building a controlled, understand, understood, sort of simpler system to simulate that complicated system. And this will be the focus of many of the talks over the next few days. And of course, the last part is pure information processing, the running of algorithms using quantum devices. And in the pure information processing domain, there is an incredibly complex set of dimensions as to what can be done quantum mechanically, what can be done classically, what the difference between these two categories are, what consequences this has for the observable universe, and also, of course, some practical things like breaking codes and searching databases. So these promises sort of push us to look at how to build larger and larger quantum systems. And of course, in the process of doing that, we run immediately into a challenge. And the challenge is, of course, I want to have a very isolated system so that my system can perform quantum mechanically without coupling to the environment, but I want to control it. And control means coupling, and coupling is necessarily means coupling to some environment. And this is the underlying friction in all of the challenges that we run into in quantum information science. One approach to dealing with this particular challenge is to use what's called a hybrid quantum system, to try and take the best of different worlds of decoupling from environment and ability to control. And of course, in the words of my old advisor, ion traps are the canonical hybrid system. Why do I say that? Well, of course, here's your hypothetical linear pole trap, a chain of ions trapped inside, you're imaging them. What have you got? You've got a nuclear spin-based quantum memory, right? Using the hyperfine states of the ion to store your information. Incredibly long lifetimes, many years ago, demonstrated 900 second lifetimes in these penning traps, for example. Since then, it's gotten better even. You then have the nuclear spin coupled via the hyperfine interaction to the electron spin. And that electron spin is a much bigger handle for the universe to grab on, right? It's got a much bigger dipole moment, consequently, you get an electric dipole interaction because, of course, the spin orbit coupling. And that electric dipole interaction, in turn, lets you address these hyperfine levels with light, quite directly. 
And by coupling to light, you can then also couple to motion. And so you have the whole hierarchy of different possible ways of keeping information in, in one nicely compact, nice little system. And in some sense, you could say the great success of ion traps is exactly because they typify the ability to control where you're having information stored, anywhere from the most robust storage in the nuclear spins down to, in some sense, the least robust storage in the motion or in the light. And being able to versatilely move around is a very useful feature. We'll come back to that concept near the end of my discussion. I probably don't need to remind you the fundamental features of these things in which I have a two-level, so hypothetical two-level ion trapped in a harmonic trap. I have the different eigenstates of the harmonic oscillator in the ion system. One of the crucial features of all these things is that you really want a system with a good cycling transition. And this, of course, basically is a statement that I want to be able to drive the system with a laser and have a photon scattered on the zero state and nothing on the one state. This is easy in atomic systems with good symmetries. It's harder in uh, condensed matter analogs or atomic systems. These cycling transitions play a crucial role in making all sorts of things like sideband cooling and spin measurements and spin motion entanglement. And it underlies all of the different couplings between this nucleus spin electron spin sector and the light motion sector. Of course, <clears throat> this is the theorist picture. And if you look at theorists, you might sort of start to think that experimental science don't particularly care for us sometimes. <laughs> Because, of course, you know, Peter Zoller, of course, I would like to have a slightly better picture of someone like Peter here, but, you know, says, okay, so this was a great idea, and then, uh, you know, a year later, Chris and Dave do this, and then, then what? So there's been, a lot, of course, lots of what since then. But nonetheless, we're actually still pretty far away from systems where there's lots and lots of ions where we can manipulate them individually, control them individually. And it's actually this challenge that I'd like to focus on for the rest of my talk. So when I talk about scaling beyond linear Paul traps, the key point is to look at how do we go to more and more ions? What are the mechanisms we can get there? I'm not going to take a comprehensive view of this, but just sort of a few stabs out in parameter space. And this is motivated in part by the understanding of different ways that we can build architectures of quantum systems. The few sort of well-understood approaches are basically that of shuttled computation in which you have your qubits and you move them around physically. You have a handle, the charge for the ions, and you move them, shuttling them around in a trap to some other location and then interact them. And this type of physical motion approach has some benefits, has some disadvantages. It's obviously been investigated very heavily by the community. We'll probably hear a little bit more about that later during the week. Another approach is distributed computation. Here you've got some small scale quantum system that you've built to very exacting standards. And you then hook the system up via fallible, imperfect links and use quantum purification and various other quantum communication techniques to en use en entanglement that you generate here that's imperfect to make very high fidelity gates between local registers. And the third approach is that of resonators, in which I have qubits coupled to bosons, long range excitations of a field, could be photons, could be phonons, where I have some effective two-dimensional architecture that emerges where the different ions couple to a few different boson modes and then can couple to each other over longer and longer ranges. Now, the linear Paul trap is a one-dimensional resonator approach with a single resonator, or actually a few resonators because you have multiple ion modes, right? multiple phonon modes. Two-dimensional penning traps are another example of this type of approach, so we'll sort of focus in on this approach first. And then I'll sort of move over to the distributed approach for the second half of the talk. I'm going to encourage questions as we go. I don't know, however, whether the ITAMP web streaming system allows questions except via the microphone. So if I can get a confirmation from Hussein about that. Excellent. OK, so just shout out your questions as they arise. And hopefully, everyone will hear them. So uh, I'm going to start talking about two-dimensional systems, many ions. And the canonical approach here is that of the Penning or penning Malmberg trap, in which I, rather than crystallizing one dimensional chain in the linear Paul system, I crystallize a two dimensional crystal by a large external magnetic field to confine cyclotronic type confinement in the xy plane, and then electrodes to confine the atom along the z axis. And these have some nice advantages. One of the big advantages is that you get a lot of ions in your trap, and you can crystallize many, many ions. We'll hear more about that later on. 
the systems in some sense is actually self-organized, it can be made stable, and the sites are pretty far apart, so they're optically resolvable. You don't have to go to the heroic efforts of Marcus Greiner to get atom gas microscopes. You can do it with sort of far field optics. And you can start to envision as a theorist, you know, rotating crystals of ions, maybe with another species on the outside here in order to relax the boundary conditions of the crystal to make a good crystal, and cross beams of lasers in order to drive gates between these ions. And you immediately run into some challenges, which are a little bit foreign to people working on linear Paul traps. But that's only because you're thinking about 10 ions, not 1,000. And these problems are, first of all, high temperature. Yes, you can cool these things beautifully, but you have phonon modes going all the way down to zero frequency. And these soft phonon modes are going to have thermal occupation no matter what you do. Consequently, you're going to have to develop gates that are very robust to a wide range of temperatures, not just sort of molmer sorensen but going beyond that. Another challenge here is that these crystals are large, and you can image them pretty well, but it's very hard to get high numerical aperture because you can't get your lensing system close to the crystal. Now, maybe John will tell us about solutions to that challenge, but my suspicion is that this is one of these things that is going to require more and more understanding and engineering of the optics using Fresnel optics and the like as we go down the road. And the third one is a sort of a triviality as a theorist. You know, it's rotating. Which, okay, fine, so you just have everything rotate, and rotate your laser system and everything else. But, of course, it's hard to rotate your laser system at 100 kilohertz or a few megahertz. And so you can imagine that that causes some initial, additional challenges, some of which we'll like to work with, and some of which we'll just have to sort of boot back to experimental efforts and say, well, yeah, but can't you do better? Thus coming back to the theorist experimentalists collide. What do we do in these, in these penning traps, in these 2D crystals? How do you make gates in the presence of all these low-frequency phonon modes? Well, there's a few different approaches. The simplest idea is to use that of the push gate, where you use the AC Stark shift to make an effective potential. So here's a sort of hypothetical structure for the beryllium plus ion. You're looking at the S one half P one half and S one half P three half transitions, and you try and set up a scenario where you've got, say, two different lasers, a red detuned one and a blue detuned one, so that you can cancel out all the mean shifts and just get a, an effective force on the ion, which is proportional to sigma z, which is the logical operator associated with 0 and 1 here. So you set all that up, you go through some effort to do so, and you basically are just making a statement that you get different potentials for different internal states, and you can sort of control the sign and strength of this interaction by changing these detunings, changing the polarizations, and a few other things of this nature. When you then turn on your laser system, hypothetically, what happens here is simply that depending on the internal spin state, the ions move. And of course, the Coulomb interaction gets reduced when they go far apart and comes back. That corresponds to a phase shift, which is your gate. So you get an effective ZZ interaction. Uh, to do this in the sort of canonical pure, uh, structure of the problem, you have to do it relatively slowly. And that's a disaster when you go to large numbers of ions. Because, of course, the slower you go, or rather, the lower frequency your phonon modes, the slower and slower you have to go until eventually you just get all your information of your spins trapped in the ion's phonon motion at low frequencies. Now, we might hear from uh, David Marcos about how we can make that into uh, a feature, not a bug, in the form of making dynamical gauge theories and things of that nature. But uh, instead, you could also say, well, how about I don't do anything that leaves information behind in the phonons? And this, of course, is the modulated I call them fast carrier gates, so there's a few different versions of the same basic name, in which you essentially try and drive the system so that the ions are moving at a frequency where there's no response in the phonon crystal. So that means you're hitting somewhere between the axial motion and the radial motion, or uh, variants of that general scheme. And the key point here is simply that I drive the ions essentially only virtually. There's no linear, there's no direct response. But because the ions either move in phase if they're opposite spin states, or out of phase, if they're the same spin states, uh, then you get the scenario where there's no change of the Coulomb, or there is a change of the Coulomb as they do this. And so overall, you get an, an effective phase that generates, which is modulating relatively rapidly over time, but ends up over long times with no information left in the phonons, and a reasonably large phase shift here, which will be your gate. So these are sort of the mechanisms, which then let you do local gates. Now you can try and uh, <clears throat> move from this local picture, where you're driving these very small and very short distance scales, to large-scale quantum simulation. I won't talk about that. You'll hear more about that later. 
But another thing you can do is try and actually use this to create a quantum resource. And for me, the quantum resource that would be most useful and natural in this system is that of a cluster state, which is just the right amount of entanglement, so the Goldilocks problem. Too little entanglement, can't do computation. Too much entanglement, any one qubit destroys all the other qubits' knowledge. So you want just the right amount of entanglement. This corresponds to a cluster state, where each qubit is just entangled with its nearest neighbor. And you can do that in these systems by taking advantage of the fact that the system is rotating. So you take the laser, you scan it through between pairs of ions as the ions circulate underneath. And basically, as the ions go by, the laser entangles nearby pairs. And over the course, essentially, of, uh, of rotations that are given by the root, number of rotations given by the root of the radius, or root of the area, so just by the radius, you can entangle the entire crystal. And so you can generate, essentially, a single cluster in, in, in order n time, where n is representative of the number of ions. So that sort of hypothetical structure. We'll come back at, again at the very end about how you might go from sort of building such entangled states to doing computation. Now the point here is not that there aren't other great things to do with penning traps, but rather that you want to be able to make good gates. And the penning traps, it's I think quite possible, but you're dealing with the challenges that are the same challenges you would deal with if you tried to stick lots and lots of ions in a Paul trap. In either way, we'd like to overcome those challenges. And I suspect we'll hear from Chris, actually, about dealing with some of those challenges at the 50 ion level. But uh, perhaps I'm being too speculative. Phil, sure. OK, very good. So what about not going to many, many ions, where this complexity of phonons starts to kill you, but instead focusing in on the few ion problem, where there's obviously been great success in getting to very high fidelity, and then coupling things up with these imperfect links. So this is what you may call the register model for computation, the distributed computing approach. The key idea here is to take advantage, again, of this state-selective transition to do entanglement generation using single photons. So you have this some emitter. You have a beam splitter so that you don't know which emitter your photon is going to come from. Consequently, the photon detection, the click event here, corresponds to an effective Bell measurement in the spin basis of these two emitters. This produces entanglement between the emitters. When combined with a good quantum memory, you can then do a teleportation-based gate. All you need is enough entanglement per second to do your gates fast enough. And this leads to actually quite a nice architecture. In practice, you need more than a single memory bit here. You, you need actually, to do it in the general case, need a Hilbert space of dimension 32. And in fact, we have a reductive example of that with five qubits. So you need one good optical qubit and four additional memory qubits in order to do all the purification you might want to deal with all the imperfections you might run into. But I suspect that there are optimistic souls in the room for whom a five qubit linear Paul trap seems like a no problem challenge. Then, of course, you have to couple these things up with the photons. And you want to build some large array of these things with some optical interfaces. And of course, there's been some success in doing these things, uh, as shown actually now several years, many years ago uh, by the JQI group and, and now by several others, where essentially you have distant ions and some high numerical aperture optics to collect their photons, and then you use photo detectors, and you get sort of one hertz entanglement rates if you try very hard. And one hertz is a little bit slow for building a computer, but very interesting for physics. So instead of doing these things probabilistically, where we have a lot of chances of losing the photons, we like to ask, can we do it deterministically? And to do that, we'll have to take a little foray into cavity electrodynamics. And I'm going to talk mostly in the microwave domain, so we're going to talk about circuit electrodynamics. <coughs> the thing that you need to remember from your uh, kindergarten classes on QED, right? We all took that in kindergarten? Is that the important parameter here, the one limited by physics, is that of the vacuum Rabi coupling divided by the resonance frequency. So a vacuum Rabi coupling is, of course, how much a single spin excitation couples to the vacuum field of the cavity. The underlying interaction here is that of an electric dipole interaction, so the electric field of the cavity coupled to a dipole charge times position. And you can quickly run through the math and discover that this vacuum Rabi over resonance for electric dipole transitions has the square root of the fine structure constant out front, as you would expect from perturbative QED coupling, a ratio of the dipole moment to a Bohr dipole, charge times Bohr radius, 
And then the square root of the wavelength of light in the vacuum at the relevant frequency, 4 radius squared, divided by what's called the mode volume, the volume of which you can find your electromagnetic field. You can do the same calculation for magnetic dipole transitions, which is used quite often, for example, in atomic physics. And you get essentially the same formula, except now you have another factor of fine structure out front to represent the fact that magnetic dipole is higher order in the QED perturbation series. And now you have the magnetic dipole over a Bohr magneton. This tells you immediately how to make strong coupling. Right? You can decrease the volume. You can increase the dipole moment. Now, ions, of course, have a nice dipole moment. Why? Because their motion is large. Right? You can have an ion with a harmonic oscillator length on the order of 7 to 10 nanometers. And so you can make a big dipole. Right? Decreasing the volume, however, is a bit of a challenge. One of the things, this is realized uh, by, of course, uh, Sholkoff and Michel de Veret and others, that if you go in the microwave domain rather than the optical domain, you have these neat things called superconductors. And we wish we had them optically, but we don't. But we do have them electrically. What a superconductor allows you to do is use a cavity which doesn't have a TEM mode, but instead is essentially a bit of coax. So the transverse dimensions of this cavity are much, much narrower than wavelength squared. Even though the length is order of the wavelength. But the overall volume now, rather than being wavelength times Bohr radius over some large wavelength cubed type volume, becomes essentially just Bohr radius over feature size. And nanofabrication allows you to make feature size very small. And so you can win big by making the mode volume small by working in the microwave domain. Another trick you can do is realize that this V here corresponds to the volume in which the electric field energy is stored. And this is the volume in which the magnetic field energy is stored. Now, in optical, electromagnetic excitations are very hard to dissociate from each other. But in the microwave domain, you can go into the lumped element limit, because your metal pieces are much smaller than the wavelength. In the lumped element limit, you have, for example, here's an example from Ben Palmer's group at LPS, where they have a meandering inductor and a capacitor system, where they've separated out where the electric field energy is stored and where the magnetic field energy is stored. And that allows you to concentrate this voltage, or this volume, and expand that volume, or vice versa. So there's another axis in which you can control this. Now, that's sort of an optical physicist view. If you're an electronics person, you think of this very differently. You think of this about, imp it's all about impedance, right? So, what do I mean there? Well, here's the sort of picture for me of how you do ion motion coupled to a, a circuit. So here is a chip trap, uh, nicely put together by my collaborator, Dave Kapinski. You have two little vias of superconducting material coming right up near where the ion is. The ion is this little purple dot. It's purely hypothetical. Length scale here is 50 microns. This is very uh, sort of reasonable -ish scales for chip traps. If you look on the, in the z-axis, in the growth axis of the system, you have these two vias. You have the ion. And then down below, you have a big inductor, superconducting inductor. That makes a resonant circuit. We've essentially emitted any extra capacitance in this. And why do we do that? Well, if you look at the electric field that the ion sees as a function of the intrinsic fluctuations of this inductor, what you discover is the electric field goes as, of course, the voltage over the distance. So the distance scale here is this 50 micron scale. The voltage, in turn, goes as essentially the quantum fluctuations of charge divided by the capacitance. And then you put this all together, and you discover that you have the quantum of resistance, 25 kilo ohms, times the characteristic impedance of this circuit times this oscillator frequency. And that determines the strength of the electric field. You want to make a big electric field per quantum fluctuation, which is what the vacuum Robbie coupling is going to require, you need to make Z, the characteristic impedance, very large. Right, so Z, of course, is just inductance over capacitance, square root thereof. And by making, essentially, a big inductor with just the self-capacitance of the inductor plus these vias, you get something where this characteristic impedance at gigahertz is between 1 and 6 kilo ohms, which is a lot higher than sort of your traditional 50 ohm characteristic impedance for microwave resonators. And by doing that, what you're really doing is just amping up the electric field per fluctuation. Of course, this R is connected to Z. Right? The smaller I try and make things, the harder things become. 
<clears throat> so let's go into a little bit deeper picture. Of course, again, we're looking at the dipole coupling, D dot E. You've got some mechanical motion of the ion. You've got the, opt the electrical motion of the circuit. You've quantized the circuit. This is just photons. These are phonons. And you look at this G, the vacuum Rabi coupling, and you get, of course, this length scale. You get the harmonic oscillator length of the ion. You get this ratio now of the characteristic impedance divided by the quantum of resistance, and you have this omega LC. So let's look at this. This first term here is electron ion distance. This is bounded. It's actually bounded because the smaller I try and make it, the smaller this capacitance becomes, the more other capacitance starts to enter. And you discover that this 1 over r can be no uh, larger than the 1 over the fine structure constant, so 137, divided by the vacuum wavelength of the frequency, and then this ratio of the character's impedance to the quantum of resistance. So you actually discover, as you go to higher, as you go to higher frequency, that you don't get z here. You really get z, q, z to the 3 halves. So getting higher character's impedance at high frequency matters even more. And also, this 1 over wavelength gets multiplied by this omega LC. So higher frequency matters even more. This term here is, of course, the phonon wavelength. Now, we would like the phonon, of course, to be resonant with our circuit. But we're going to go to high frequency. And uh, gigahertz ion traps, uh, in terms of their intrinsic trapping frequency, are um, a little rare, I might say. So that's going to be always uh, at lower frequency. And not, the, not to mention, you want to make the phonon length large, which means you want a low frequency ion trap right? in order to make this coupling big. It turns out it's very hard to make the impedance uh, even close to the quantum of resistance. And if you're an electrical engineer, you immediately say, of course. Why? Well, of course, if I have an inductor, I have self-capacitance. If I have a capacitor, I have self-inductance. And the only real way to bring this past the quantum resistance is to use nonlinear inductance in the form of Josephson devices. So I'm not going to talk about that part directly. And then, of course, there's the circuit frequency. So we put it all together. And in, in a lot of engineering scenarios, it ends up being that the, the Q of the microwave circuit is the thing that gets fixed. That it's, it's sort of straightforward to build a Q of a million microwave circuit that's planar at 3 gigahertz, at 1 gigahertz, at 50 megahertz. But to get it much beyond that in planar geometries is extremely challenging. So if the Q is fixed, what you discover is that the ratio of G to the cavity decay rate kappa is actually best at high frequencies. So you see immediately this refrigeration. You want a low ion frequency to make this length long, and also, of course, to make your ion trap system work in the way that we already understand. But you want a high circuit frequency in order to get the coupling large. So if you set this down at 10 megahertz, set this up at 1 gigahertz, you discover you can get a pretty big G here, 100 kilohertz for the coupling, which is a good starting point. With the little caveat now that I have to somehow convert the frequency. So we took a stab at this problem uh, what a year ago or so, where we said, well, let's just take this LC circuit coupled to an ion. Here's this LC, and there's additional capacitance associated with those vias and the ion, and let's modulate the capacitance using a mechanical parametric device, a bulk acoustic wave resonator. And at simplest level, what's happening is there's this dipole coupling, and now the capacitance is being modulated at some frequency nu, and so I get a parametric coupling between the position and the charge. When this frequency matches the frequency difference, I get parametric conversion of ion excitations to LC excitations and back. That's a whole new technology that people doing superconducting circuits don't know about and people doing ion traps don't know about. So we went back to the drawing board a little bit and said, well, what if we can make it a little bit easier and use superconducting technology and ion trap technology, but not also mechanical technology? So here you have to imagine that you put a Josephin device sitting in between with this inductor attached to it still. And you're going to use Josephin junction-based frequency conversion. That is, run it like a paramp. Two technical slides, and we'll be almost done. So it's, again, a circuit of this nature. I have this capacitance, I have this inductance. But now, rather than having a variable capacitance, I actually get this effective variable inductance and capacitance term associated with a driven Josephine device. So this is the actual picture of circuit, my Josephine uh, junction here with a, with a Josephine capacitance and its associated Josephine energy, and also a shunting inductor. You drive this system with a sinusoidal flux drive. That sinusoidal flux drive will cause the system to look nearly classical. It's going to look like a harmonic oscillator. It's oscillating in time, however. 
So you first you find the linearized solutions of the problem. So you get this effective harmonic oscillator picture here, where this is the coupling that you got between the ion and the charge. And these are the canonical variables q and phi of this LC circuit, effective LC circuit. You can't drive the system very hard. If this eta is on the order of one or larger, this circuit is no longer stable, and the linearization fails. So you have to make it relatively small. And you also, of course, have a parametric oscillator. Now, conveniently, everyone here is extremely familiar with parametric oscillators. Matthew equations were your bread and butter when you were growing up as a graduate student, right? Good. So, you won't mind that I use them briefly. The key point, of course, is when I have a small drive, then I get Matthew solutions to this problem. I have effectively oscillations at the resonance frequency of the circuit, and then sidebands. The first sidebands generated at plus and minus difference frequencies. And this one is the one we're going to use to frequency convert. You put it all together, you find that you get a, an effective reduction of the coupling from G to basically G times 8 over 4. So that's a, a price that you're going to pay. And <clears throat> you have some other constraints here. Right? Because, of course, I need the whole thing to be stable. So you put it all together, and, and you start to say, well, let's look at the function of the ion frequency and also this eta parameter. And you have uh, the nonlinearity of the paramp, which is along this axis, these numbers increasing nonlinearity. And you essentially need to bound this below about 0.2 in order to get good single photon gates. So this green region here is forbidden. So you can't make eta very large, consequently. The other problem is that you actually need the, the ion to remain trapped when you do this. And that ends up being a constraint here on this eta parameter as a function of the ion frequency. So if the ion is too low frequency, it ends up being parametrically driven away. And that puts sort of a, a cold, a hard bound on your ability to get large eta, because you just run into this corner here at around 25 megahertz. And we don't see any, this is for brilliant. We don't see an immediate way around that. Nonetheless, it is a reasonably large coupling. So you started this 100 kilohertz coupling, and you're down now to about 10 kilohertz, which is still faster than the decay rates. So you can start to make some progress. It's worth mentioning that you can take molmer sorensen type techniques with this combined ion-phonon LC system and actually do direct spin to LC photon coupling that's insensitive to the thermal excitations in the ion's motion. Now, this either sounds trivial or extremely hard, depending on how much you've worked through molmer sorensen type gates. If you haven't worked through them a lot, you'd say, oh, of course, just molmer sorensen But there is a slight challenge, which is that molmer sorensen really only works with spin half. And uh, surprisingly, a harmonic oscillator is not spin half. So you have to go through a little bit of extra effort. You start to look at the system. You have a term uh, in this double drive. So you drive the parametric coupling at two frequencies. You drive the ion spin motion at two frequencies, right? one above, one below. You get an effective coupling and interaction picture between the x and p motion of the uh, ion's position and this capital M operator, which represents a charge operator and a sigma x operator. Charge of the LC and sigma x of the spin. <clears throat> and what you discover is you can get a unitary at these periods, n over delta, which is of the exact right form you want, this m squared. But because it's not spin half, the q squared term doesn't close. So you have to use a spin echo type technique to remove the q squared term. This is basically because the closure of spin does not occur for the LC. And you have to be careful of these higher order corrections. So there's always going to be actually a sort of six order correction, which you can't get rid of with echo techniques. Yes? Um, so you could, but it turns out that your goal, as I conceive it, is actually ion-ion coupling. Yeah. Okay. So, uh, <clears throat> so you want something that's long range, and the problem with nonlinear elements is that they concentrate the energy locally. So you actually want to minimize the energy concentration to get something that's big enough that you can couple ions at long distances. So you really want distributed elements for that. It's worth mentioning that you can take the same spin to LC molmer sorensen and actually drive two more sidebands and thus go directly spin to motion to LC to motion to spin over long range if I have ions here and ions here that are sharing the same tank circuit here. And this is now insensitive to the thermal fluctuations of the ions motion here, thermal fluctuations of the ions motion here, and thermal occupation of the superconducting inductor here. And that's kind of where you'd like to be, simply because I've talked to a number of ion trapping groups and everyone seems really let's say, uh, 
pessimistic about the concept of 30 millikelvin ion traps, uh, you know, for large scale technology. So it would be nice to do this at one Kelvin um, with pumped helium rather than in dilution refrigerator. And indeed, you can run the numbers for this type of setup and discover that if you can get that characteristic impedance up to about 6 kilo ohms, then you're looking at 30 kilohertz type coupling rates down to about 10 kilohertz once you put all those pieces in place. So you can get long range coupling at 10 kilohertz, which is a nice step upwards from 1 hertz, which is kind of where we were sitting with the optical photons. It's worth mentioning, of course, that another thing you can do is change the phonon, photon coupling problem. So you had before this problem that I want to collect single UV photons. And UV, of course, is a challenge to collect. It's hard to get close to the ion. Instead, if I couple to an electrical system, I can now try and couple electrical excitations to photons. And there I have a versatile interface allowed to me via optimum mechanics. So in optimum mechanics, you have a parametric coupling, electric field squared times position of a mechanical structure, like an oscillating membrane. You put a large pump field in, you get an effective parametric coupling, oscillating at the pump frequency, quantum field of the cavity, and the position x of this mechanical degree of freedom moving up and down. So the pump is just mixing these quantum fields. It's doing frequency conversion. This has been done now by a number of groups. You can then hook this up to electromechanics, have an LC circuit, which is transducing to the mechanics. And essentially what you can talk about is a scenario in which you have the ion, which is moving to electrical domain. And once you're in electrical domain, you have a number of options. And in particular, the versatile interface would in principle allow you to work with very different photon frequencies, like infrared or telecom, where you can go long distances and get good optics. So this is, of course, uh, we're trying some of these ideas out with Eugene Polzik's group with neutral atoms, but the basic idea remains. And the key point here is to make some sort of versatile optical interface by first moving to the electrical domain and then going from there. I won't talk about those experiments. I just want to mention, uh, sort of conclude with just a brief outlook. So I sort of talked about these penning trap systems. I find them very intriguing for good memory, for lots of ions. They have a challenge, which is that it's hard to do good gates. Perhaps you could build cluster states. And you could ask, well, if I just built cluster states, where can I go with there? And you could actually think about hooking these penning trap systems up to a linear Paul trap processor with optics. So you sort of break your penning trap up into different clumps and treat each of these as a little register, a prepared resource for your computation. And then you use the Paul trap system, which is relatively fast in comparison to the penning trap system in order to do some of the gates and some of the purification protocols. The other thing I want to think about is sort of this general question of long-range entanglement. Yeah, so we have this photon-photon between two different systems. We've got this photons on the same chip. You know, what other ways can we go? And for me, I feel like there's a lot of interesting opportunities there, particularly in the mechanical domain. And I think some more exploration there is going to be extremely exciting. So I'll conclude by thanking the members of my group who worked on this project, particularly Prabhin Antikari, who worked on the parametric oscillator work, and Devir Khafri, who worked on the math of these molmer sorensen approaches, and then my more senior collaborators who basically helped me conceive of many of these ideas. And uh, thank you for your time. Thank you, Jake. Plenty of time for some questions, discussion? Glenn. Is the over kappa a hard requirement, or are they like dark state EIT techniques that don't require G to be larger than uh, so the question is whether g squared g over kappa is the relevant parameter or something more like g squared over kappa gamma. And uh, it is actually g squared over kappa gamma once you put it all together, except uh, with the proviso that I need to put the thermal heating rates into. And so it ends up being that uh, this sort of spin motion, LC motion spin, is limited by this cooperativity parameter, but it's the quantum cooperativity parameter. And so you really suffer from temperature there. And so it ends up being you still want a G of about 10 kilohertz or faster. <coughs> so it, it's true that I should have really focused on productivity. Um, but yeah, as, as, any, as anyone can tell you about the anomalous heating problem, it's, it's this effective anomalous heating rate that's going to kill you. And so we we'll have to be careful with the cooperativity until we understand that better. Can you tell us more about these uh, bulk acoustic? I don't know. I've asked you this before. Yeah. It's been a while, though. Uh, sure. Bulk acoustic uh, wave devices. So. <coughs> The general question is, what do they work <laughs> beautifully? Uh, do they work in the way we want them to? Not necessarily. So um, the basic question is, how do I make a parametric converter out of few gigahertz? Uh, and one approach is the superconducting approach. We're using the superconducting nonlinearity. Another approach is to use uh, essentially piezoelectric material. And 
the bulk acoustic wave device is a, a thin film where the resonant mode is the motion of the film this way. And it turns out at cryogenic temperatures, these things are amazing. They get cues of 100 million between 100 megahertz and gigahertz. And they have some nonlinear terms, which typically. Is that a mechanical cue? Mechanical cue. Yeah. Is there an electrical cue that's relevant? I mean, is there a series resistance? No, uh, it's, it's actually the effective cue of the combined electrical mechanical circuit. So it, it's, um, it's kind of absurd. <coughs> So the Mike Tobras group in Australia has shown some of these stuff in the cryogenic devices. The one interesting challenge from a parametric converter perspective is that you actually want a system where the nonlinear term is the one that is interesting. And they go to great efforts to build these devices so that they're not <coughs> nonlinear. So they're what? So they're not nonlinear, because the device would like to be nonlinear. And so the challenge at the moment is to sort of take a, a step back from the great successes of the last 20 years in those devices to ask them, yes, but let's turn that nonlinear term back on. And if you run the numbers, as a theorist, it looks very good. But building these things is, is a very serious industrial process. So what one really wants is to take a, a sort of essentially commercial process and with minimum conversion, get these types of effects. And we think it's possible. It's an area of active research for us. What is clear is that the phonon scale at a gigahertz is pretty short. So you are restricted to using these sort of bulk modes because you need things that are very small. But you want them to be physically big enough so that you make an impact, so they have to be large this way and small this way. So I have a question. I mean, I, I haven't followed since your original paper with Dave Kopinski, but I mean, sort of where, for the kind of thing you laid out there, where do the, how hard do you need to drive this thing? What are the voltages on this thing? Uh, I will call it Sam Benz approved. So, <laughs> So uh, I was very concerned about how hard you have to drive the parametric oscillator, the, the superconducting device. And it turns out that you're driving it uh, sort of a flux quanta per 10 nanoseconds, which is, a, which is below, which is the S regime of a Josephine device. So it's basically still operating as a quantum device. And um, yeah, I was very concerned about this because... I was, asking, I, I was asking more about the you know, acoustic wave resonator, you know, how hard you have to drive those to get that. Oh, well, actually, acoustic wave resonators can take way more energy than adjustment devices. I so, what are the voltages? <laughs> you know, like oh, oh, oh. you mean how much? How, what's the what's the oscillating voltage system? I worry about the parasitic effects of the voltage you, know, you need to drive it with. Sure, sure. So uh, you're actually not looking at a very large voltage drive, again, because the mechanical cue is extremely high. Which what? what? <laughs> how much voltage? Oh, like five volts. Sorry. Uh, yeah. Sorry. Yeah. I mean, if, if you if you had a mechanical Q of a hundred thousand, like we were first thinking about, then you're looking at more like five hundred volts. But once you realize that the cryogenic Qs easily exceed ten million, then suddenly it becomes much lower voltage. Okay. So we'll just go ahead. I mean, if you if you have a parametric device, you could use it probably to. I mean, you can use it to up convert signals. So that. Could, so I wonder why those. Um, Acoustic um, devices haven't been used as uh, as amplifiers, sensitive amplifiers to measure oh, noise. Oh, there's a really simple reason. Those transistors are really good. So if you want, I mean, both acoustic devices are essentially room temperature devices. That's what they're aimed for. That's their market segment. And um, the noise floor of a transistor there is quite good, and very high bandwidth. You know. Uh, in a classical device, you, you do use a transistor to do up conversion. That's the nonlinear mixer, right? You take your signal and your high frequency beat and you hit them on the front end of the transistor. So, sorry, I mean. Yeah. It, I mean, it, since the bioacoustic. Yeah. AW is, is a, the quantum device, you can potentially go into the quantum regime, which would be better. Yes, than yes, that's right, that's right. If, if you want to get past that last 3 dB of amplifier noise, yeah, this is where you'd have to go. Um, but I, I just, I think from an engineering perspective, um, you can use an off-the-shelf 20 cent mm -hmm. device, so or you have to build a whole new <coughs> story. Never interesting. To just hasn't been interesting, yeah. But in the quantum domain, once you own this thing, you can't use a transistor, obviously, because amplification will be no longer quantum. And, uh, and so then you're, you're stuck. I think the big challenge with the bulk acoustic devices for commercial application or anything like that is simply they're very narrow band. 
you know, the consequence of really high Q is that you have really narrow <laughs> frequency ranges in which you can operate. And so that, that becomes a real challenge if you try and uh, do something that's broadband and, and sort of communications oriented. Anybody else? Yeah. Oh, maybe we should move on again. Thank you. Yeah, thanks.